You want the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? You can't handle the truth! Well, we're giving you the Michigan Sports Truth, the show that is honest, reveals the facts, truth, and statistics, and does not mess around. Follow me, Taylor Phillips, on Twitter at DT2Phillips. Email me at TaylorGatorPhillips14 at Yahoo.com. Follow Ed Smith on Twitter at EdSmith313. And go to our website at MichiganSportsTruth.com. Also like our Facebook page, The Michigan Sports Truth, and join our Facebook group with the same name. The Michigan Sports Truth podcast on Spreaker is also available Available on iHeartRadio and SoundCloud. Also a subsidiary of Sports Radio Detroit, thus available on iTunes and Podbean. This podcast is particularly not for entertainment purposes, and the views expressed by the host of this podcast are opinion-based. However, they do not come without facts, research, statistics, and truth, whether other people like it or not, and no matter how harsh or complicated it may be. This is the Michigan Sports Truth, and nothing can ever stop it from being correct. And welcome to episode 274 of Spreaker Sunday. I'm Taylor Phillips, your head host of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, along with just Frank Vashner this week. Buck Gina will be on talk show. He's uh, on assignment. Ed Smith still away due to private personal reasons. Frank, how are we doing this week? Because of work and... But, you know what, I'm glad to be here, and glad that I'm finally done umpiring baseball until the spring. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's uh, getting near near the end, end of July, uh, which uh, is actually the appropriate segue for the Tigers here. That one is long Because we are about to announce a trade of our own regarding the Tigers. They traded J.D. Martinez to the Arizona Diamondbacks for three not so good infield prospects, Dawell Lugo, Sergio Alcantara, and Josh King. According to Keith Law, they're not in the top 50 or the top 100. And the Arizona Diamondbacks have the worst farm system in Major League Baseball in 2017, due, uh, but prior to uh, this year's spring training. And and I've listened to you this this morning. I listened to your uh, interview with uh, Derek Lawson on After Further Review on WXUT eighty eight point three FM in Toledo. Uh, you you pointed out that Alavila should have waited un, until the trade deadline. I I'd, I'd say that I would say that uh, uh, now now keep in mind. Still, Alavila should not have waited un, until that until any day later because he missed he still missed out on a much better farm system which went to the Chicago White Sox seven prospects seven much better prospects than the than those three Arizona Diamondbacks prospects that the Tigers picked up in that JD Martinez trade in the Jose Quintana trade those seven prospects going to the the uh, the White Sox for Jose Quintana that went to the Chicago Cubs so uh I, 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 that was, uh, I, I thought that, that was a, that would have been a much better idea for Alavila. Just go after those seven prospects from the Chicago White Sox instead of just waiting it out for a long time. Well, I think the whole waited out thing was something I echoed from our good friend Jeff Moss at the Detroit Sports Rag. Because if, I thought if you waited out a little more, then you possibly drive Martinez's value up a little bit. And then you might be able to get a better return from him, and maybe you possibly get a different team that throws their hat in the ring. But to me, to me, it seemed like like Al Avila said, okay, J.D. Martinez is available when he takers. And Arizona seemingly jumped in quickly and said, we'll offer you Lugo, Alcantara, and uh, Jose King. And Avila said sold, and the deal was done with a stroke of a pen. I, it seemed like to me he acted a little bit too quickly, and went after three and got those three guys. Which I know that Lugo was 
Arizona's number four prospect, according to MLB Pipeline, but this is also the same MLB Pipeline that said Stephen Moya was the Tigers' number two prospect at one time. So you and I both know how incredible they are. And, of course, none of them were in the top 100, according to Keith Law, who, to me, is the Mel Kuyper Jr. of baseball. I know I said the same thing on AFR. So, I mean, that's why I thought Avila pulled the trigger too quickly on a trade, and I thought possibly should have waited and maybe get another team to possibly throw their hat in the ring and see who they offer up in return. Now, and you mentioned the Cubs and who they they paid a king's ransom for Jose Quintana. I've still heard that Alex Avila could be a possible candidate to get shipped to the Cubs, and mm-hmm. they may be able to get a nice return because, A, he's a catcher, and the Cubs love to platoon catchers. We saw that last year in their World Series run. And, B, he's a left-handed bat, and left-handed bats don't come at a dime a dozen. So it'll be interesting to see what happens before the trade deadline. I understand that, too. And... Ian Kinsler recently was added to the trade market. The Milwaukee Brewers were digging into the possibility, quote-unquote, according to ESPN's Buster Olney, in, um, that they were digging into an idea of trading for Ian Kinsler. And then today, the Red Sox showed their interest in Kinsler as well. So let's not forget Ian Kinsler in addition to Al Avila, Justin Wilson, and Justin Verlander. So J.D. Martinez is already off the market nonetheless, although Al Avila made a terrible trade just getting those low ball, three low-ball prospects. Yeah, and I think this is actually the first I've heard the Red Sox being interested in, in Kinsler, but I mean, I'm not, I really don't know what their farm system looks like. I mean, it's... I guess it's really no surprise given that Dave Dombrowski is running the show there now and maybe he wants to get some veteran help in Boston because I know they've got not a lot. The core of their team, while it's very good, the kill, killer bees that would be of Jackie Bradley, Xander Bogarts, Andrew Benatendi, and uh, I, there's probably a couple other guys here and there whose names escape me right now. But the thing is, those guys are fairly young. I mean, while they're talented, they can play. Come playoff time, what are they going to do when the bright lights are on? So, I mean, I can understand Dombrowski possibly wanting to get somebody like Kinsler and somebody who's been around, has some veteran presence, and just kind of take all the young guys under his wing and say, hey, we got, hey, let me guide you guys here, here and keep everybody calm and controlled when it gets to be crazy. They just want to keep it calm and positive like Brad Osmus. Get the fuck out of here. Oh my goodness. Yeah, it's... See, that's another thing. I mean, I could yell and scream and, and curse about this, but you know what? I'm just becoming numb to it. Me too. The fact that Iglesias commits a stupid base running error when I believe it was Omar, Omar Vizquel told him to stop at first and he goes on to second and gets tagged out. And That's arrogant. Brad Aus- and I think it was Ospis who was bitching about whether the ball was fair or foul and he tried to say it was, it was foul. It just shows how clueless he is. I mean, look, it's not the ball was ruled fair, and I mean, I didn't, I didn't watch the game last night for that matter. But if it was that close to be a fair or foul, and he goes and runs when the skeletal and the stop, I mean, that's not a glacius. I mean, if your first base coach tells you to stop, and you're like, nope, I'm going to second. Fuck you, the skel. And he gets tagged out. Glacius has nobody to blame but his own damn self. Are you out of your mind? Yeah, and and, and Brad Osmus is not taking any accountability for Jose Iglesias' base running mistake, and that's and uh, he, instead he complains about the call, even if it even if Osmus had a point, he still complains. You're just a crazy um, coward. Th- th- things just keep, things just uh, keep going in dysfunctional directions. Yeah, but of course.
course, they end up taking two out of three from the Twins, who seem to be just as dysfunctional. But then again, it's the AL Comedy Central. Go figure. Of course. Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's the AL Comedy Central because uh, Cle- Cleveland may be in first place. The defending American League champion Indians, supported by Miranda McCoy and Betty Cantley out there on the other podcast world, national podcast world, the AL Comedy, the American League Comedy Central. Even Jeff Moss was uh, doing was uh, naming that Comedy Central. Because he yeah. actually he knows it too. Yeah, because the division is just so weak. I mean, granted the Indians are a first place team, but this ain't the same Indians team from last year. Here, I mean, it's, it seems like they're going through a somewhat of a World Series hangover. And I mean, the the Twins are showing that. They, I mean, they're not the same dumpster fire that they were, but. I still don't trust them. The Royals are a mess, and of course the the Tigers and White Sox are just complete dumpster fires. The Tigers won today, and so are the Indians. The Tigers are still six and a half back of the Tribe. And uh, then, then the White Sox... They're, last I checked, they were 11 and a half back. Let me check the standings real quick on the MLV.com app, app mobile app, as I uh, use this phone to call call you on Facebook Messenger to co-host with you. They are 12 and a half back. They've lost now nine straight. Oh, You God. are pathetic! I mean... The White Sox are like the new epitome of the American League Comedy Central. The Tigers are right behind them. Yeah, and the White Sox also made they also made a trade this week with the Yankees. They sent Todd they sent the corpse of Todd Frazier to the Yankees and got a and got a much better return than what the Tigers got for JD Martinez. I believe they got one guy they got from the Yankees. His name escapes me right now, but I know he was ranked number the twenty fifth best prospect in all of baseball according to Keith Law. Oh yeah, uh huh. That compares that 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 goes in comparison to the J D Martinez trade that the Todd Frazier trade brings better prospects than the. Much better prospects than the J.D. Martinez trade, and and the White Sox um, farm system just keeps slipping out of the Tigers' fingers. Like Al Avila doesn't even know it. He doesn't even know what the fuck's going on. Yeah, and honestly, I think in a couple of years the White Sox could be challenging for the division. Maybe in the, either a couple or a few years, but for the Tigers though. Now, their future is bl- completely bleak. Their farm system and their scouting department, they, they can, they, for years, they have continued to be off, awful, an awful hot mess. It, and it's only going to boil down to the owner, Chris Illich, who, who has no choice, nonetheless, but to sell the Tigers. And don't forget the Red Wings uh, still might be on the table, too. Jeff Moss kept pointing it out on Twitter just yesterday. The Red Wings could could change hands too, and you can follow Jeff Moss on Twitter at Jeff Moss DSR, the founder, editor in chief, and and owner of the Detroit Sports Rag. Yeah, and honestly, both teams can't be sold soon enough, especially the yeah. Tigers. Haven't won a World Series yeah. since the year I was born, nineteen eighty four. To the audience out there. Yeah, and you and you and I will agree on this that the last eleven seasons or so, where they haven't, where from like two thousand six till a few days ago when they dealt Martinez, it's been a failure. Mm-hmm. 
and of course people will say no it's not because they're not because they were a dumpster fire before that look I don't give a shit how bad they were before that I don't care that they almost set the major league record for losses and then a few years later got to a World Series the fact the fact of the matter is they've been to two World Series and have gone a combined one and eight in games and all in both and the one game they won they had to cheat to win because I mean, you might remember 2006 Kenny Rogers had pine tar on his hands yeah they played nine World Series games uh, by by the way total and and they won one of them but yeah, Kenny Rogers. Yeah, that that that's illegal. Yeah, and, and the I fact know. is that that '06 World Series. I mean, I. It's like, how the fuck are they losing to this Cardinals team? Because that team had. Oh, they had just they, they were they were not only did, did were they a nervous rack they rack they were that which makes them only makes them cowards, but um, they they. Uh, they couldn't even. They were like st- stage fright. They they were also inept. They, they were they were uh, too desperate. They weren't even staying calm. Um, and Jim Leland with his uh, stupid in game decisions, it, it it also partially cost them. And the Tigers fell apart. They had Brandon Inge on their team, mind you, one of the most inept players. Ever in this franchise. Yeah. And, and, I, and I'm going to echo what uh, Justin Spiro said on one of his previous podcasts. He said, I think it was when he had Chris Castellani on, he said that that, that Cardinals team was managed by Tony La Russa. Of course. And, and I mean, granted, they were only a couple of games above 500. And people want to say, oh, managers don't matter. Well, that Cardinals team... If that was a team managed by Brad Ausmus, they don't even sniff the postseason. No, I'll stay. I'll stand by that to the dead. I mean, I mean, if I, I mean, if if you, if I'm to pick one manager in baseball who I that never that no affiliation with the Tigers, it have it has to be Tony La Russa. That's somebody I have nothing but respect for. I do too. He's one of the best managers in Major League Baseball history. Absolutely. And, I mean, I, uh, I mean, uh, Jim Jim Leland did lead the Tigers to two World Series, but he he just wasn't smart. He wasn't as smart as Tony La Russa. He wasn't sm- as smart as uh, uh, Joe Torre, for example, when he led the Yankees to multiple World Series championships in the late in the late nineties to two thousand. Yeah, and, uh, even, and even though those Yankees teams were absolutely loaded, and they had the core four of Bernie Williams, Derek Jeter, Jorge Posada, and Mariano Rivera, who was the greatest relief pitcher to ever exist. In fact, I, in fact, Taylor, I'll even admit to you, I I despised the Yankees. But if there was one Yankee that I had absolutely nothing but the utmost respect for, it was Mariano Rivera. I mean that guy. That guy. I mean, on and off the field. I have two Yankee. Not. I have respect for two Yankee players, him and Derek Jeter. Oh yeah, Je- Jeter as well too. I mean those. I mean those guys were just class. I mean, they weren't. They weren't. Le- they weren't like like a Rod and getting involved in a bunch of shit off the field. And, and you know what? You're seeing this new Yan- this younger Yankees come in like Aaron Judge. That's a, I really like how he conducts himself on and off the field, too. Ooh, Gary Sanchez, another one, too. I mean, it seems, it seems like there's, there's no douchebaggery around the team anymore. No, there, there's not. But along the way, the Tigers took four out of the last seven. They split the series uh, against the Kansas City Royals, took the first two, and then dropped the, the last two, including Thursday 16-4 to the Kansas City Royals at Kauffman Stadium. They they still managed to take two of three against the second-place Minnesota Twins. 
Uh, both both the Kansas City Royals and the Minnesota Twins were were in second place the last time in check in a tie. The Tigers still, my God, they they took two out of three against the the Minnesota Twins. And you know what? The fact and plus, people say that they could have swept that series because the ser- the game they lost, Kyle Gibson was starting for the Twins, and Kyle Gibson is a dumpster fire of a pitcher, but yet he seemingly shut the Tigers down, and of course their bullpen seemingly just let in a few runs, and of course we get the whole tip your cap routine to some tomato can pitcher, which I get so sick and tired of all this bullshit say. And look, yeah, I'll say look. Craig Monroe. I'll admit, the guy, the guy I'll, I mean, if it was up to me, I'd say, yeah, the guy pitched a great game, no, there's no, there's no denying it. However, that doesn't excuse you from a piss performance from your offense. Yeah, you got. You just say, hey, you got to be able to hit better. I mean, you got to be better at the plate. I mean, just because he pit, he was pumped up and fired up and came to play, you can't use that as a crutch. Right, and and Craig Monroe on Fox Sports Detroit just keeps using that. Uh, he, he sounds like a robot now. It, it just makes Tigers Live post game shows even more unwatchable. We we become numb to that as well. And speaking of which, the Tigers' television ratings have dropped twenty two percent during their dismal season. We heard from Bless You Boys just last night. Uh, yet they're still in the top five. They're, they're still the top five teams in top TV ratings. Uh, behind the Orioles, the Cardinals, the Indians, and the Royals, the, uh, only the Indians in that top five have gained per- rating average rating percentages by twenty nine percent, seven up to seven point five two. The Tigers have dropped to five point four two as of right now, as of last night. Well, I think the re- well, I think we could say the reason why the Indians' ratings have jumped is because. They've been at the top of the division. Obviously, they made it to the World Series last year. So, I mean, if you have success, more people are going to tune in. And if you're and if you're stinking up the joint, people aren't going to watch. I think it's pretty simple and easy to understand there. Uh huh. So, um, yeah, that's we're just going to make that that short and sweet. The entire article from Bless You Boys is right there for everybody to read. So, um, there's that. But uh, speaking of the Red Wings... <laughs> Tomas Tatar had his arbitration underway earlier the past week, and then, two days ago, Ken Holland somehow cut it short... By signing Tomas Tatar to a four-year, $21.2 million deal to avoid that arbitration. Oh, man. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. One thing, I I, I think that's a bad thing because uh, Ken Holland, may I point out one thing for sure, is trying to get the Red Wings back into the playoffs only to embarrass themselves in the first round. But then again, he might even fail to make the postseason for the second time, for the second season in a row, if you know what I mean. Well, I I said this on AFR, and I'll say it again. I still don't believe this team is a playoff team. In no. fact, I, I very well see them finishing in dead last in the Atlantic. But the people who will say, oh, Ken Holland finally did something right... No. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna point out what Buck Gino tweeted. I can't remember who he said if he said it to uh, Jeff Moss or somebody, but he said that it was possible that Tatar took a look at the 2018 free agent market and said, you know what, it's probably better that I take the money now, now and get and make something over the next four years rather than going to that market where it's really crowded and possibly not make as much money he over or more of a term so I think it was I think it was more Tatar who was the winner and that's that 
Holland wasn't as big of a winner. In fact, this now puts the Red Wings over the salary cap. Plus, they still have Andreas Athens CU to sign. Ryan, and they've got to get something worked out with him. And also Robbie Russo. Now, Russo, I think, is probably just going to get like some form of a bridge deal. I don't think he's going to get too much. Probably a couple of years of maybe not more than one and a half at the 1.8 million over that. But half in the CU, this is where it gets interesting. Now, granted, he wasn't arbitration eligible, but given that we have seen what he can do on the ice, there could be some team that decides to go out and sign him to an offer sheet and really try and pay him a hefty amount of money, and that's going to force the Red Wings to either match or let him go, but they would get compensated for it. Now, I'd have to look it up, but I believe that if you, if somebody offer sheets a restricted free agent and you don't act on them, I think you don't, I don't think you get a, any first round pick a, as a form of compensation until it gets upwards of six, seven million dollars, but don't quote me on that. I know if you sign them upwards of eight, eight, nine million you have to give up four first-round picks, but I don't think anybody's going to sign up to see you to that kind of money. Yeah, and Ken Holland, speaking of money, is trying to take up the entire cap space with that new deal on Tatar. Not, not a lot, not quite, not quite allowing uh, Athens to see you or Robbie Russo, the remaining restricted free agents, for the time being, much money. And, and think it all about. If Anthony Mantha is going to get paid at all, either two or either one of the two, you're right because he's going to, he's going to be due a hefty raise down the road. So, and but of course, I think I had share, I had shared this, and I know you shared it as well. It was from Pro Hockey Talk and NBC Sports that yep. the the next buyout window is going to be open on Monday and close on Wednesday. That would be the time for the Red Wings to utilize set by a window, and what better player to use it on than Jonathan Erickson? Because yeah. obviously he signed a hefty contract in 2013, oh, which man. pays him like four—I want to say four and a, is it four and a quarter or four and a half million? Big mistake by Ken Holland. Like, yeah, it, it was because because Erickson was not healthy at that time either. Therefore. Yeah, I, I, yeah, because I remember that because he was, he had a shoulder injury, and it was also around the same time where his his firstborn daughter was born as well. Yeah, um, he, and he played through the pain. He, back. he played through the pain. Yeah, he, he had a yeah, cause he, yeah, because I think they had a what? It was a they had a I think they had a road trip out to Colorado and Arizona. And then they came back and announced that he was going to sit out because his daughter was born, oh. and also because he had he had separated his shoulder and he was going to miss a few games. And then later on that year, he ended up shattering his finger and was knocked out for the rest of the year. And I mean, at the, at the time, I thought, you know what? They gave him a contract extension. Maybe he'll be. A, I mean, at, at that time, he was he wasn't playing like spectacular but at the same time he wasn't playing absolutely god awful and wasn't really the punchy back of the team that title belonged to Kyle Quincy if my memory serves me correctly but then after a few years down after a year or so down the road things just went to hell in a handbasket for Erickson now I think really if Ken Holland has any common sense at all, which we know that he doesn't, this would be the time to buy him out because you're going to clear up cap space. You'll be able to sign Athens CU probably to a two-year bridge deal. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to be any more than uh, one, I want to say 1.25 million annual average. Just kind of to say, you know what? Prashant Dyer's got, got all the details on that, especially. 
Uh, he, yeah, he, he does, and he's got all the analytics with that, too, and I'll, I'll just leave all the explaining of that stuff to him because he's the best at it. Follow so Prashant, get, follow Prashant Iyer on Twitter at Iyer underscore Prashant, I-Y-E-R underscore P-R-A-S-H-A-N-T-H. Continue. Yeah. So, I mean, you get after the Z resigned after you buy out Erickson, you get Russo resigned, and then you obviously are going to put Johan Franz on long-term injured reserves. But I also, I still think you may have to put Nick Cronwell on long-term IR as well. I mean, I don't, I don't have cap friendly in front of me right now at the moment, but just to make sure that you're under the cap so you don't have any issues. But because honestly, I would say right now I don't think Nick Cromwell even makes it through the whole season. I think at some point, even if he does play at the start, or there's probably a likelihood that his knee is just going to be hurting so bad, and he's just going to have to go on long term IR for the rest of the year. And that'll probably he's probably just going to spend the remainder of his contract on there. Here, because you and I both know that you can't out, outrun or outskate Father Time. So, I mean, his contract, that comes off, that'll basically not count against the cap. You buy out Erickson, I mean, granted, you're going to have that dead money, but it'll still be, it's still a bit of a savings. And I think at this point, it's better to just pay the man and let him go rather than just be paying him for the next three years and let him just be a construction barrel on skates. But I also think that, and this is something that Jeff Moss pointed out on Twitter today, that the the te- that the Detroit teams seemingly don't know how to use compliance buyouts, right? I, mean, I don't know if it's on Twitter if I was reading an old DSR article, but when the new NHL CBA came into place, you were allowed two compliance buyouts, which means you could buy out two players, you just pay them their salary, and it would not count against your cap. Of course, Ken Holland decides to use one on Carlo Koliakvo, who he signed as a, like, right before the lockout as, def- as a depth defenseman for two years. And Koliakvo only had one year left on his contract, and it wasn't really pricey either, so... I don't really see the sense in you wasting a buy on that because he only had like one and a quarter million you were paying him. He falls, you could put him on waivers and it put him in Grand Rapids. And then he uses one on Jordan Tutu, which I believe at the time Tutu had one year left and it wasn't that big of a hit. We can, you and I can both agree that he should have used that buyout on Johan Franzen. Because Franzen wasn't really producing, and people and people are kind of saying, "No, oh, no, you can't do that because he's a very cool scorer, and he's a party uh, yeah, yeah, the cap." Well, what? it wasn't really the cap hit that was an issue with him. It was the term, which was his contract didn't run, doesn't run out until twenty twenty. So, I mean. What Holland should have done is just use that compliance battle on France and say, you know what, thank you for your time here, but you know what, it's a business, goodbye. And they would have been clear of that, but of course, down the road, didn't realize Franz was going to end up getting injured and never play again, and then you can long-term IR him, and that money doesn't count against the cap, but you know what, hindsight is twenty twenty. Right. So, that's the whole scoop on this Tatar deal. Now, we're going to transition. One, one more thing I did want to bring up. Uh, there was some, something I I may have shared to our Facebook page. Uh, Jeff Salashko, the Red Wings goaltending coach, Nate mentioned about Jimmy Howard playing 50 to 55 games next year with Jared Coro being the backup, and no mention of Peter Marazic. I find that to be very interesting. Hmm. Does that does that mean hey, Slashko let something slip that this is that we've seen the last of Marazic? Hmm. After um, 
Pina Marazic not going anywhere in the expansion draft due to, despite being left unprotected for the expansion draft. All this can all this leads to him possibly leaving Detroit. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this is something that's going to bear watching in the next few weeks or so. I mean, given that Slashko said we want Jimmy Howard to start 50 to 55 games and said Cora was going to be the backup to the mention of Morazic, I just happened to find that Are you out of your mind? But, again, who knows? It could have, it could have not to nothing, but I would say that one, just stay tuned. Yeah, I would hate to see Morazic go, but then again, I wouldn't blame him for leaving that that dysfunctional excuse for a general manager in Ken Holland. So, I would, yep, I agree with you on that. Yeah, let's transition to Pistons here. Left side line, three of the answers. The Pistons earlier the past week. Earlier the past week, we're still taking, we're actually taking phone calls about possible trades for center Andre Drummond. Oh man! Which means other other teams in the NBA, the National Basketball Association, are actually interested in taking Andre Drummond, regardless the price. Uh, uh, call me crazy on that last part, but um, anyway, but they were interested for some reason, in Andre Drummond or other NBA teams. And the Pistons still not giving up trying to trade him. Either that, or I'm I'm only saying that they should not give up. They should take advantage. And I'm with, and I'm with you, man. I think it's good that they're trying to move him because maybe that's a sign that Stan Van Gundy is getting fed up with Drummond being a mental midget, as Jeff Moss likes to call him. And so, But, of course, then the word comes out of Cleveland that the Cavs are looking to trade Kyrie Irving because Kyrie Irving says he wants out. So is there something possible there? I mean, I'm not it does. Well, sure, but that's, that's, a, not that's another appropriate segue on this episode. Which leads to this article from Bleacher Report, Rivier Ruff, headlining, Andre Drummond fires back at a fan who said he should be traded for Kyrie Irving. This was from... Oh, come on. Uh, Ruben Rodriguez, Detroit Pistons trade Reggie Jackson, Stanley Johnson, and Andre Drummond for Kyrie now. And Andre Drummond replies with emojis, and this is why you are typing from a cell phone and not a general manager. And, and let me uh, let me dig up um, that entire Twitter conversation. And Ruben Rodriguez replied, if you spent more time practicing your free throws instead of responding to fans on Twitter, this convo conversation, convo for short, might not have been sparked. And I, and I invited him to an interview on my podcast. I need to have an interview with you on my podcast sometime soon. You bring up valid points. He said he pro, he replied to me. I'm all in. <laughs> kind of like magic, huh? But Andre Drummond responding to fans, blocking some of them, at least some of them. Andre Drummond just dishes it back out like an insecure teenager from middle school. Like a bully, for example. Classless. Andre Drummond can't even mature up in any way, shape, or form. You're just a crybaby, a coward. That, that sounds yeah. more like a troll, too. Ah, shut yeah. up, you uh, uh, I mean, here, Here's the thing. If, if you're a professional athlete, and, I mean, look, Fans are going to criticize you no matter what. Yeah, because of your but free throw worst, shooting. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, yeah, even, even if you do stuff right, I mean, there there's going to be those who troll you and nitpick you for a bunch of stupid shit. But the worst thing you can do is respond to them. 
Now, look, I can understand blocking them if they start making threats against your family or you or anything of that nature. Which is not the but, which is not the case. But if they but if they if they're calling you out and they've got facts to back it up, I mean, you should probably you should just not the just not just don't pay attention to them because if you go and respond to them, or at least admit res- that that. Or at least admit you that you, that you make mistakes. Yeah, but if you go and respond aggressively to them, then that's what, that's basically the equivalent of arguing with an idiot. I mean, I've been told this a lot from from supervisors, from college professors, and you name it. They say. You can't argue with an idiot because he'll bring you down to his level and beat you with his experience. Experience doesn't matter. Yeah. I I understand that, but, I mean, just, uh, if if the lowest common denominator is just tweeting at you for stuff, I mean, regardless of whether it's performance-based or not, it's better off just let them say what they want to and leave it alone, hone, because the moment that you turn around and start firing back at them, they know that they've got your goat. And you basically stoop down to their level, and that just shows that you can't handle them. Now, if they, and like I said, if, if it was a matter of them sending threats against you, or your family, or anything else, then you can step in and block them. That's when you step in and block them. But, in this instance, we don't have that. So, and it's better for Drummond to either just, A, own up to the fact that he's got to be better, or B, ignore him. Just don't pay no attention to what fans say, because the moment that you start getting, because I've heard this several times, don't talk about fans unless you're going to say that, hey, our team's got the best fans and whatever. That's the only time you should say anything or say, hey, thank you guys for coming out tonight. Appreciate you. Blah, blah, blah. But don't start attacking them because that is a slippery slope. Yeah, it, it just makes the fire uh, grow even worse. So that's uh, those are options. It's A and B. Option C, just admit that admit that uh, you, you did something wrong, you try to improve it, try to make up for the mistake, and whatnot. So that that's the whole thing. So, one last team to cover, it's the Lions. Touchdown, Detroit Lions! Lions defensive end, backup defensive end, Armani Bryant, was suspended four games for violating the NFL substance abuse policy. Just a, another another example of undisciplined action. Um, for for the historically worst franchise in sports history, not just the NFL, but but sports history. You are pathetic. Yeah. And again, I believe this is now Bryant's second offense in less than a year. Oh my god. They should let him go. Yeah. I, th- I think Bob Quinn's just got to say, we gave you a second chance, you blew it, there's a door, don't let it hit you on the ass on the way out. Hit the road, Jack, and don't you come back no more, in the word, in the immoral <laughs> words of Ray Charles. Uh, yeah. I, I would agree with that. I think they, they've got to send a message. I mean, plus, Bob, plus, if Bob Quinn is so committed to doing stuff the quote-unquote patriot way, where if you screw up, you had, you might get a second chance, but you damn well better toe the line, because if you screw up again, you're going to be out of a job. And I think it's better they just cut ties with them and say, hey, we get, you, got, you got another chance? You did, and you ended up screwing up again. Adios. Simple as that. Yep, that's true. So now we come to two segments. We'll start off with 
the one segment that we call Five Questions. Are you ready, Frank? Let's do it. Question number one, should the Tigers tank again first before they sell? Because I because I pointed out, or should or should they buy like Jeff Moss of the Detroit Sports Rag recommended them to uh, in the middle of the past week? But remember, the, the Tigers again, like I said before, like we said before, they're not built to be a playoff team. They're not even built to make the postseason with their manager Brad Osmus and and with the uh, corpses of Miguel Cabrera and Victor Martinez and um, and whatnot. Also, y- you got. You got the uh, awfulness of Tyler Collins earlier in the season before they DFA'd him. You, 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 it comes down to their sub-500 record, which puts them to, in totality in fourth place in the American League Comedy Central Division. There, there's, there's absolutely no way that the Tigers can come back and, and even make the wild card. They're, they're still not... They're still not good enough. I'd say tank before you sell. And, and I'm with you on that. Because for one, you're not built to buy. I mean, your farm system's already been depleted. And look, I know you got guys down there. But those guys, you're going to need for the future. You can't go and sell, use those guys to buy and have nothing left again. Because that's just, you're just kicking the can down the road. You don't make the playoffs, and then, what do you know? You're back to being the mess. Well, now's the time to start rebuilding, just throw gas and everything, and just burn it down, start over. Because if you delay the inevitable any longer, that's just going to drag everything out, out and drag everything out, and just make it look worse. And it'll be, and it's going to, and who knows, you may end up hitting the, Mark the depths of the 2003 team that lost 119 games, but maybe even past that, that. Yeah, that, that could happen as well. But the fact of the matter is, the sooner you start the rebuild, the better you'll be in the long run. I mean, yeah, you might you might be bad for a couple of years, but we have seen it and in baseball. We've seen it in hockey. We've seen it anywhere. Rebuilds do not have to take longer than five years. And I've said this time and time again, they can be done in a few years if you have the right people in the right places making the right decisions. Uh, that, that's right. And the only thing that will fuel that is the the team sale by Chris Illich. Then it will get everything going. Like, it's like like unclogging. It's like unclogging an entire culvert full of mud and sticks, like I did two weeks ago in the woods in Merritt, at, out in the woods next to my grandma's house, Grandma Suzanne Phillips's house, just like twenty twenty five miles away, twenty five minutes away, twenty minutes away actually. My dad and I uh, help helped on that. I was the one that got inside that that culvert. To a river, and um, it, it, it was a tough job. But man, I, I let it all out. Yeah, I, I can I can imagine getting all that shit out of the culvert, getting the water all flowing again. I mean, I've I mean I've done my fair share of helping clean out ditches as well, and I know, I know how much of a pain in the ass it is. Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, it gave me a backache a little bit, but uh, it was worth it. Yeah. And, and, and Grandma Suzanne paid me fifty bucks for God's sake. <laughs> it was a. It was like a like almost a high reward, if you know what I mean. But but back to uh, that first question, the toughest decision that we had to make right there was disagree with Jeff Moss, but we had to do it. Yeah, I agree, and I think what Moss was really wanting is like, you know, what we, you got, you got, 
saw that they were only a couple games back of the Indians and thinking, you know what? Get in the first place, you get in the postseason. That was in his crystal ball. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, the, th- the thing that always makes me mad is people think that once you get in the playoffs anywhere, it's the old anything can happen mantra, which to me, I think is bullshit because you have to look at how a team is built. I mean, yeah, you see these wild card teams will go on a run to World Series. Well, those teams are the exception, not the rule. Right, but the one, but the one main thing that we agree with with Jeff Moss on is that the Tigers need to be sold, and they will. Even the Red Wings and Lions, uh, even the Red Wings could be could be sold. They're, they're on the table. The Red Wings could change hands. I found that tw- tweet again a few, like like ten minutes ago. The Lions are a mystery inside that tweet. So, oh, that being said, wait a minute. Wait a second. We're, hold on a second. Just apologize for the delay. Next question. Question number two. Has Tigers general manager Al Avila shown his own stupidity after all this talk about Chris Silich running the whole organization? I would think about would the TD Martinez that. trade. Yeah, because I, I'll, I'll say it again. I thought he jumped. I thought he really jumped the gun and traded him too quickly. Because I think he needed to just kind of wait a little bit, maybe let another team throw their hat in the ring, see what they had to offer, because he seemingly <coughs> jumped right at the first <coughs> offer, which was the Diamondbacks, and he said, okay, it's old, and that was it. You got, as a GM, you've got to be able to gauge the market better, <coughs> trying to let other teams no, that's one point offers, I agree with you that. never know when somebody else is going to offer something better. Right. That, that's one. That's one point I agree with you. The other, uh, the other point earlier was the the White Sox had the one of the best farm systems in in baseball. That you mean the Cubs? The Cubs did. The, Cub, the Cubs did. Yeah, the White Sox have it now. The White Sox um, got even more prospects. That took even more prospects from the Yankees in the uh, Todd Frazier and David Robertson trade. That that that's all. That's all gone away now. Al Avila would have done more homework in, than that before the J.D. Martinez trade, like I pointed out. The, the Tigers exactly. should not have missed that. So, to summarize it all, maybe it doesn't even matter if it's too early or too late. You, it's it, One point I agree with you on, once again, you got to gauge the market better, but except at an earlier time. Like, yeah. Like at the end of May, for God's sake. Yeah, and you can't, and you can't, and you can't go and say sold when you only got one team offering, especially when it's, you have a lot of time before the deadline. I mean, that's when you say, "Hey, okay, we got an offer from you. We'll get back to you, uh, and we'll then see what happens." Yeah, well, we'll, like, we'll actually see what happens yet, yeah, but I think that was an inept trade. And yeah. that, that'll be graded on the What's Your Grade segment coming right up next, but we got three questions left, so... Next question. Question number three. Is the Tomas Tatar signing going to get the Red Wings back into the Stanley Cup playoffs next calendar year? I say a big, fat, definite no. And I say the same big, fat, definite no as well. Because, this, because look, the team still hasn't really changed too much. I mean... People, I mean, yeah, they added Trevor Daly to their blue line, and he makes it somewhat better, but that's not saying much since their whole blue line was a complete dumpster fire to begin with. So I still, I still don't think that this is a playoff team, and everyone, and all the shells are going to say, "Oh, well, over half the league makes the playoffs." Blah blah blah. <laughs> I don't think they're even that much better this year. It might fact, get worse. I, yeah. Because, look, and I said this on AFR, I mean, look, the Atlantic isn't very strong, but the top, let's say, is, is that other division of the East, the Metro,
Metro, Metropolitan. which is absolutely loaded for bear. Because, I mean, I'll kind of gaze into the NHL crystal ball a little bit. Every time I hear those two divisions, it, it reminds me of my own NHL conference realignment uh, concepts. Yeah, but I'm going to just kind of look ahead. The Atlantic next year, I see these teams making the playoffs as the top three, and this is kind of how I think it could go. I think it'll be, I think Toronto wins the Atlantic because I really like the direction they're going. I think Tampa has a bounce back because they had a lot of injuries, but I think if they stay healthy, they finish second. And then Montreal slots in third and then over in the metro obviously it's going to be what in no particular order pittsburgh washington the new york the new york rangers will still be have their hat in the ring the columbus blue jacks i don't think are going anywhere and i honestly think the carol this might be the year the carolina hurricanes finally get in the playoffs because they've got a lot of young guys I really like the direction they're going. And they're, I think they get the last wild card spot. And he, even then, you still, I will. It wouldn't be a compl- it wouldn't be a complete surprise to see a team like New Jersey even and sneak in because they could they could have a bounce back year. Philly could bounce back as well. They they seem to be up and down and a yearly basis. And, the, and, of course, the Islanders are, well, the Islanders. But that that Metropolitan Division is just ridiculously deep. And I think they get five teams in. And if you do that, you're only going to have the top three from the Atlantic. And I don't see the Red Wings getting, being any better than Toronto, Tampa, or Montreal. Hell, I don't think, I don't think they're going to be any better than Boston or Buffalo or... Ottawa, for that matter, as well. Yeah, I, I have to agree. And um, central di- divisions and the Pas- central division and Pacific division with the Las Vegas Golden Knights. I think the Las Vegas Golden Knights should end up in the Pacific division with the. Uh... Well, they, they are in the Pacific. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, and you know, just just for shits and giggles, I'll I'll even tell you right now that Central Division, holy shit, that is the, I think the Central is the toughest division in the NHL because obviously you got Nashville who made the Cup final last year. I don't think they're going anywhere. Chicago's not going anywhere either. Yeah, the predator, the pre- I re- that reminds me of the Predators sweeping the Blackhawks this the past season. The Predators it, not not only made it to the Stanley Cup final, they made it six games before losing to the Penguins, who won back to back Stanley Ch- Stanley Cup championships. Yeah, and people say, "Oh, well, they were an eight seed." Well, again, look at how they were built. They had four of the best defensemen in the NHL uh, as the backbone of that team. They had one of the top goaltenders in Pecorine. So, I mean, you had guys that were going to help you win. And plus, they had some you know, younger guys contributing as well. Unfortunately, they did lose to injury. Guys like Ryan Johansson, Kevin Fiala. I mean, not to say if this happens, then it's a different story. But I think if they don't lose those guys to injury... Possibly we see a series going seven at least, but enough of that. But speaking of that central division, you have Nashville, Chicago, St. Louis, I don't think is going anywhere. Minnesota, I still think, is going to be in the hunt for the playoffs. But also, the Dallas Stars have gotten significantly better as well because they've they've added Ben Bishop and Ned. That's going to help their goaltending. They got Mark Bethot. To add to their blue line in a trade with Vegas. Plus, they signed Martin Hansel to be their third line center. That team is going to be pretty loaded. And Dallas, I wouldn't be completely shocked if they make it to the Cup final. And plus, you have to remember, Ken Hitchcock is back behind the bench, and 
they won a Stanley Cup in 99 when Hitch was the bench boss. And plus, Hit, I think they've got guys who can fit his system. They were playing so- just playing a solid two-way game. I mean, they're not going to... Burn, they're not going to burn you with speed. I mean, they have, they do have some guys who are quick, like Jamie Benn, Tyler Sagan. But, the, so, I mean, they could skate with, like, the Pittsburghs and Washingtons and teams of that nature. But the thing is, they're going to play a little bit more of a, they're going to play a little bit more of a structured game, and they're going to be very sound defensively now that they have bolstered their defensive core and plus upgraded in that as well. And, of course, the Pacific Division, I think, is going to be Edmonton, Calgary, and Anaheim. I don't see San. I think San Jose is going to take a step back, and the rest of that division is what it is. Uh-huh. I have to, I have to go back to Nashville for a bit. Victor Arvidsson, a seven-year deal? Holy shit. I'm like, what the hell is yeah. that all about? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, for, I forget what the annual average is, but they essentially gave him a Justin Applicator type deal. A lot of money. Although, I believe, I believe Arvidsson is a better scorer than an Applicator. I think Much better, be, yeah. But, but the thing, but again, I still, I still have to wonder what, I still can't have to wonder what was GF David Poyle thinking. I mean, that's, I don't think it's a knock on Arvidsson, but I think maybe he needs what they would have worked better is just give him kind of a, a cup a bridge deal just to again okay you played pretty well this past year even during the playoffs let's see what you can do the next two years and then we'll lock you up for even longer. But again, that's just me talking. Any. Either way, you you got a good point. So anyway, moving forward to question number four. Next question. Question number four: With the Tomas Tatar signing done and over with, can the Red Wings buy out defenseman Jonathan Erickson's contract so they can free up for Andreas Athanasiu and Anthony Mantha and Robbie Russo? Can they? Yes. Will they? Ken uh, Holland. Yeah, I know Ken Holland. Probably, probably not. Any general manager not named Ken Holland can do wants to do that. But we all know. But Even if he, can, know, he, he doesn't Holland want to. His lap dogs. Yeah. Uh huh. But I, I hey, along with Justin Abbocator, Darren Helm, Danny DeKaiser. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, t- to be honest, I I really think Holland's hand's going to be forced here. He's going to have to make a move to clear up cap space. Otherwise, somebody's going to offer. Somebody will offer she happens to see you and Good point. and Bruce up, and there he's going to lose them both. So I mean, I think he has to use this buyout window. Well, starting tomorrow and. Erickson's gonna have to go. I mean, it's he okay. he may not have a choice if he wants to keep Appleseed on Russo. Somebody's got to go. That's just how business works. But, but then again, Ken Holland may not want, still may not, uh, personally may not want to keep Athanasiu or Russo or Mantha because it, he, for some reason, he, he, he they. At the team of Athens, the tag, this tag team of Athens, Seo and Mantha, and uh, Ken Holland and Jeff Blaschel were heated last fall, if you know what I mean. But um, and, and Jeff Blaschel kept mistreating Anthony Mantha and Andreas Athens, Seo all season long, and Ken Holland apparently was uh, a green. Agreeing with Jeff Blaschel the whole time, it, it still might go on. Yeah, and then uh, and then it'll it will end in a better note, a bitter note. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, they may not they may have they may not have a choice 
other than Mayon Erickson, unless they somehow find a trade partner for Peter Morazic, and yes, that that could that could still happen as well. But I think you either got to trade somebody with a hefty contract, or you got to buy somebody out. It's going to be one of the two. Doing nothing isn't going to work here. No, probably. No, definitely not. Next question. Finally, question number five. Can the Pistons still trade Andre Drummond? I still think it's possible. The question is, will it? Uh, I'm with you there. I think it's definitely possible that they could trade him. But will they? I mean, I'm honestly leaning towards no, but who knows? Again, other teams are interested. Pistons yeah. kept taking calls for possible trades for center Andre Drummond. That was according to an article from thescore.com. And I, th- and I really think that they've got, if they move him, that's going to get get them out of cap hell. I mean, who, I don't really know what... And free throw talking. shooting trouble, for instance. <laughs> Those are two things. Oh, yeah, but that, that too. But, yeah. But, of course, the question is, what would he net in return? Draft picks? Somebody, younger, bunch of younger players who are on cheap contracts? Or I, uh, I, gonna... Yeah, that, that, that's a good point, too. That, but then again, there's that other part that, where they have to find a, a new center to replace Andre Drummond. I mean, Marcus Gasol is the best option, no doubt. Yeah. I mean, look, I know you and I, you and I both love Boban Marjanovic, but yep. he, but, but having him go from just a bench player to be in the starting center or in a, that short amount of time, in a that's a pretty big risk. So, I mean, I think you got, you got to get yeah. somebody in and then let Boban just be kind of that complimentary piece and have him come in. If your starter gets into foul trouble, or you just got to give him a breather, and then everything works out nicely. Yeah, not to mention Boban Marjanovic still needs to work on his defense. He's a mon- He's a tall, giant beanstalk offensively, and he, and he can hit free throws, too. He can rebound and score. He still he still needs to work on his defense. That's it. That is true. Plus, he needs to pick up his running speed, and and fans have a point too. But uh, they they keep yet, but in the process, the fans keep ignoring his tremendous offense. Thus, hate him. That's that's still something I don't understand. They still hang on to the, they still hang on to Andre Drummond. Ah, shut up, you idiot. Uh, Those are slap dicks. That, I would agree with you. That um, that have uh, awful co- cognitivity skills. So that's that wraps up our five questions segment. And to our entire audience, if you want to answer those five questions, just replay that segment portion of the episode and ask and answer them the best you can without going out of line. Now comes the other segment, What's Your Grade? Pencils down, everyone. It's time to find out what's your grade. Only two to grade. First and foremost, the J.D. Martinez trade. I can't. I can't see how anybody can't give this a passing grade. I have to give it an F because Al Vila pulled the trigger too quick on the first offer he got from a team with the worst farm system and did not get a single top 100 prospect in return, according to Keith Law. So, it's an F for me. Yep. Same here. Again, Again, not only uh, gains the market better, but at an earlier time. We'll make this sh- shorter and sweeter. For example, at the end of May. And finally, 
the Red Wings signing Tomas Tatar to that four-year deal, avoiding arbitration. That's a tough one. A little tough. Yeah, it is. I, I got to do this in two parts. I mean, for Tatar, I have to. I got. I think he realized that the free agent market wasn't going to be that kind to him in 2018. So. I've got to give him an A for choosing to take the money now and say, you know what, when he hits unrestricted free agency at age 31, maybe he'll be able to get a better deal, you know, out of it, rather than just going in 2018 when the market's a lot tougher to get a deal done there and who knows what happens. So, but for Tom Holland, I mean, I can't, I can't give him a failing grade because, again, at least he didn't sign him to a seven-year deal worth a six million annual average. But at the same time, still put the team in cap hell. Still has Athens to you and Robbie Russo to sign. So I'm going to give him a D plus. Yep. Um, I'm. I may have to. Uh go that exact same grade to uh, uh, to uh, summarize it all. Of, of course, Tatar stays with the Red Wings. I mean, I, I can't blame I, I can't blame for either staying or leaving, but then again, the cap space leap, dogging Athena CU, Mantha, and Russo, uh, that can't, that, that, that's unacceptable. That's why you still have that option to buy, to buy out Jonathan Erickson. Like you pointed out, Ken Holland may be forced to do so, even though he doesn't want to. You're absolutely right. His hand is forced here. Yep. So that's our what's our that's our what's your grade segment. So for our audience, if they're if they have grades for each event, post them in the comment bank below this episode. Please don't go out of line. So that wraps up the First episode named Spreaker Sunday, episode 274 in totality of the Michigan Sports Truth podcast on Spreaker. Spreaker Sunday, the type of week in review show edition. That's the name of it. Of that edition inside the show is Spreaker Sunday. Before we sign off, we want to remind everyone to share this episode and our entire podcast on social media and have their friends share that as well because we want to, we want to tell them that the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast organization is boosting its posts on its Facebook page and searching for local advertising sponsors. If anyone has a business that's interested in sponsoring this program, you can follow Sports Radio Detroit on Twitter at Sports Radio DET and send them a direct message or email them at sportsradiodetroit.com in the contact section or email its co-owners Roger Castillo and Carlos Peligro at, at rogcast81 at gmail.com and or sportsradiodetroit at gmail.com. Also like their Facebook page and join their Facebook group. And finally, find their podcast available on iTunes and Podbean. Frank, uh, thanks very much. Hopefully we'll do this again next week. All right, I appreciate it. Absolutely. So, for... Frank Vagner, you can follow him at Frank underscore Vagner on Twitter. V A J C N E R is how his last name is spelled. On behalf of Buck Gino, who will join me later tonight, and you can follow him on Twitter at Buck Gino I I I, three capital I's for Roman, Roman numerals for Buck Gino the third. And you can follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips. Follow me on Twitter at DT2Phillips. On behalf of Ed Smith, on Twitter at EdSmith313. This has been the Michigan Sports Truth episode 274. Spreaker Sunday on Spreaker. Like the Michigan Sports Truth Facebook page and join its Facebook group. We'll talk to you next week on episode 275. Thanks for listening and downloading TTFN. Ta-ta for now. Oh, Mr. T.